introduction. Um, thank you all for spending your evening with us. Um, not as jittery as I expected. I'm on sabbatical, so I haven't taught in a while. So I'm like out of practice. I was like, oh man, I'm gonna be rusty. Um, but we'll we'll go for it here. Um, we're gonna go through a couple ideas, concepts, and frameworks that I've been thinking about and working on for the past little while. Talk about a few of the specific projects I'm involved in and some great work that's happening up and down the coast. And so we're kind of gonna touch on a bunch of different topics and move around uh, the coast with a, this focus on uh, indigenous participation, leadership roles within uh, what we do broadly under the conservation and climate change arenas. <clears throat> to start, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna use a few different metaphors here, but I'm gonna start with this braided um, metaphor, looking at this continuum of where we are. So, so thinking about where we are now and, and how we got here. And so if we think of this braid as a timeline, we can start with, with the past, the, the pre-colonial history of indigenous leadership, indigenous stewardship and management of lands, uh, moving to an attempted erasure and marginalization, and then slowly moving to recognition and value of indigenous knowledge. I often think of, about this um, as this more consultive or the seat at the child's table. We're over here making the big decisions, but boop. But we value you, but you get this little table. Um, moving to more engaged, which might be a seat at the table, but still not full uh, leadership um, power. Moving into some visions of partnership and what the futures could look like. Um, in Meads, pa Meads Crosby's paper, which I think came out maybe yesterday, um, she talks about indigenous engagement moving towards indigenous leadership. Um, Right now we're thinking of this as moving to a indigenous leadership model where Western science is invited in. And so communities determining what they need, um, how they want to manage and restore their landscapes and inviting in partnership as needed. We're gonna explore this concept through three different kind of spheres in this overlapping Venn diagram. This is a framework I've been working on with Natalie Bloy also from Western and you know, who doesn't love a Venn diagram? So if you can put <laughs> something indigenous in a Venn diagram, it's working out well. So we've got three different parts of this Venn diagram. Um, the first is resurgent indigenous play space. This relates to following indigenous law, rights, and title, um, using ancestral ways of leadership, decision-making, and value systems. Um, so we can think of this as following indigenous law around when to harvest, how to maintain ecosystems, beaches, prairies, free from external input, free from uh, colonial input, rules and regulations. This is our ancestral way of doing it, our ancestral laws and values, and that's what we're going to follow. It's place-based because every community does things a bit differently. One community does things differently than a community thousands of miles away, and often different than the community right next door. We can look at um, the bottom one here, political decolonization or land back. Decolonization can be viewed in a few different contexts, um, but in the land back movement, there's a distinction between landowners, um, land banks, conservation organizations, allowing access and community ownership of those areas. And so the land back movement's really focused on, on the, the ladder of community ownership of that property land. And then, where most of my work is actually more centered in indigenous and Western braiding. Um, in this framework, indigenous knowledge and Western science are braided, uh, where each braid maintains its own identity, uh, where neither is more or less valuable, and the braid is stronger than the sum of its parts. And so I'll give examples of each of these and then talk about a program that touches on all of them. Um, so that's fine. Uh, so first we'll talk about resurgent indigenous. Um, one example of this is the Trans Mountain Pipeline and the Tsleil-Waututh Nation. Uh, the Trans Mountain Pipeline is an expansion of a pipeline that runs from Edmonton to Vancouver to increase um, an increase of oil tanker uh, traffic through a, a terminal, expansion of a terminal. This expansion uh, is, is going to triple the volume of crude oil moved along the existing pipeline route. 70% of that oil will be transported to the West Ridge Marine Terminal, uh, representing a seven-fold increase of tanker traffic going from 
once a week to once every day. Uh, this storage terminal um, location is directly across from the Slow Tooth uh, Reserve and in their traditional territory. Following the model of indigenous resurgence, the Slay with Tooth um, gave their opinion on the matter. So rather than following colonial law, they were following ancestral law and, and used that to determine um, if to support or not support this project. And so um, in their report, they said, we stand together as Slay with Tooth people and we say no. We say no to the risk. The risk is too great. Our obligation is not to oil. Our obligation is for our way of life, our water, our people, our Snewa, uh, according to our Snewa, our law, uh, this project represents a risk to the slay with tooth people that, that we're not willing to take. And so in this instance, they're based this argument on, on a legal doctrine, on a legal structure, their indigenous legal structure. Um, and that was the, the basis for their um, statements and interaction with this. <clears throat> the, um, one of the counselors said, this will exaggerate, exaggerate climate change, um, critically threaten Southern resident killer wells and put at risk the ability for future generations of the slave tooth people. Uh, they viewed it as going backwards that the slave tooth is, uh, is doing a lot of work to clean up salmon streams, uh, clam garden beds and um, the life and ecosystems of all habitats. Now, um, the outcome here um, was not uh, not in line with what they wanted, not in line with their indigenous law. The pipeline is going forward. It's currently under construction. Um, there's been stops and starts, uh, but it's an example of a, a nation standing up using their indigenous rights and title and law to um, engage in, in a political activity. Um, and it can be viewed as a way of saying we can stand uh, free and operate free of a colonial structure and adhere to our ancestral laws. Looking at uh, land back, uh, there's been a, a variety of land back projects. This is one that the Nature Conservancy and other organizations engaged in um, with the Colville tribe. The Colville Reservation um, in 1872 was about 2.8 million acres. Um, it went all the way to the US Canadian border um, as granted by President Grant. Uh, and, the, and it's actually the Confederated Tribes of Colville uh, so it's 12 different nations together on, on one location. In um, 1891, the reservation was cut in half and it was reduced to uh, 1.4 million acres and then further reduced through the Dawes Act or the Allotment Act where individual par parcels of reservation were given to families that then often sold off. And so it went from 2.8 down to 1.4 million acres and then broken up after that. Um, through a project with uh, Conservation Northwest, they raised about four and a half million dollars. Um, some of that from TNCs, a lot of it from private donors, and TNC donated property uh, for a large parcel of land, about 10,000 acres that was due to be sold. Um, portions of this land had already been sold off um, in, the, in the housing developments. The landowner wanted to see it um, preserved um, and agreed to sell it to Conservation Northwest to four and a half, who gifted it to the Confederated Colville tribe. Um, and this property is part of the original 1872 reservation boundary um, and now has that land protected under reservation status um, and free from the external development. The land will be used for traditional practices, hunting, gathering cultural, culturally important plants. However, we can start to look at the land back movement in more complex areas. Um, this map is hard to see, but where the highlight is, is Orcas Island, where the little pin is. It's hard to see because there's so many overlapping territories here. Um, on Orcas Island alone, according to nativeland.ca, which um, is pretty good and the list looks accurate by my read, there's seven different tribes listed as having overlapping territory in one location. Three of those are First Nations now in BC. So how does land back operate here? If you're a landowner or um, uh, NGO group that has a parcel of land that wants to participate in land back, wants to give that land to a tribe, which, which one do you pick, right? Um, and picking one 
uh, can be viewed as perpetuating the colonial structure of, uh, of external folks identifying, categorizing, drawing boundaries of who you are, where your lands are, and what they view as appropriate. Where in reality, this is a shared landscape that was accessed through familial connections. Um, access to, to places was done through who you're related to, um, not what sort of plastic ID card you carry in your pocket, right? And so by enforcing this to one individual tribe, you're helping support or, or perpetuating that colonial structure of you have to have this ID card to get into this location. And it, it, it hits the road um, or water um, in some groups I'm involved in, like the Coast Salish um, Youth Stewardship Corps, where we're working with a group of intertribal Coast Salish youth for on the land and on the water education. So we have a group of folks from all sorts of different tribes. Where, where do we belong, right? We're not all members of a single tribe. And so as we're moving around this complex landscape, uh, trying to do it traditionally, we're actually bumping up against this individual tribe land ownership issue. Um, so it can get really complex in the land back movement, uh, determining who, why, and what. Um, but this is a move from the, the, prior, um, the prior model of you can use our, these lands, we grant you access with a bunch of caveats about when and where and what can be done. And so in other places like the Colville example, it's more straightforward. The land was originally part of the reservation. It was changed. If it's contiguous with a reservation, when that land's transferred to the tribe, it can easily be transferred into trust land or reservation land. For lands that are not contiguous with a reservation, it actually takes an act of Congress to have that put in, in trust. Um, so it's a longer process. And thinking about the Dawes Act of really breaking up a lot of reservation territories, um, there is a big checkerboard here that can start to be filled in. And then for indigenous and braiding, um, can't really talk about braiding without talking about Robin Wall Kimmer um, and braiding sweetgrass, where she talks about uh, braiding indigenous wisdom and scientific knowledge through the view of, of plants. Um, and also some, some other models that are similar, um, two I'd seen, this uh, work by Andrea Reed, um, where we can view this as kind of three different models. One is a singular eye or singular model of, of Western science or sort of a status quo, or engagement of indigenous knowledge through assimilation, um, still viewing everything through one eye, through one lens, through the lens of, of mainstream or Western science, or through a two-eyed seeing approach where you're incorporating, valuing both indigenous knowledge and Western science. There's areas where they overlap, there's areas where they differ, but we're accepting both of them, we're using both of them, we're seeing both of them. Uh, braiding can also be um, looked at, uh, you can use clam gardens as an example of braiding. I'll go into clam gardens more, but this is uh, work from the Southern Gulf Islands where two clam garden features that haven't been maintained for a few hundred years have been restored um, through cooperation with the federal government and 10 different First Nations. Um, in this example, those First Nations decided what restoration looks like. How do we manage the beach? How do we rebuild this rock wall that was knocked down before this before it was rebuilt? How do we tend the beaches? How do we till them? Um, what does this actual restoration look like? And then the scientists were to figure out how do we measure and monitor what's happening, um, and as well as address additional uh, concerns around climate impacts. Um, sea level rise, what that's going to look like with the with the rock wall, pollution impacts from ferry boats um, and and other other impacts. And when we're looking at this location of transformation, it's more in the Western science community than than the indigenous community. Meaning that through this process, the indigenous communities didn't change. They implemented their ancestral management, but the Western science scientists engaged in the in the project started to uh, go about things differently, started to understand how to interact with community, how to um, present questions, how to be respectful, how to engage in culture first and then do their science. So there's a big transformation here in this project. Um, and it's not, the, it's not on the indigenous side, it's, it's on the Western science side, learning how to interact and respect 
indigenous knowledge um, and use that backing to frame their scientific questions. Um, and another uh, indirect benefit was a better relationship between agencies and community. Um, in this project, it was a partnership between uh, the Canadian Park System and these 10 different First Nations, which had traditionally had some differences. This beach, in fact, um, is on a, a federal park reserve and harvest is banned. And so the, for the nations involved, for the past number of years, they've been banned from digging clams here. And now we're doing a project where we're trying to make more clams so we can harvest them. Um, and so that's changed that relationship between, the, uh, in that case, the government entity and the local community. Now we can think about these three frameworks um, and a way of building and approaching these relationships um, is using an equitable exchange. And this is a framework we can operate in where we're looking at, and I really don't like the word currencies. It sounds kind of cold, uh, but we can look at currencies in the academic world and community currencies. And so in the academic world, you know, our currencies are grants, awesome grad students, uh, papers, things like that. But what are the currencies in community? So if we're gonna go do a project together, I as an academic know what I'm looking to get out of it, but what is the community looking to get out of it? Um, what is their currency benefit? What makes them want to be engaged in this, in this project? For a long time, um, the answer was, and even I just heard it three weeks ago, the answer is it's good for them. I as a Western science know it's good for you. So this project's good for you. Um, and then it turned into sort of assigning things. Like we heard, I heard you like um, gifts. And so I brought you something. And then the, the equitable exchange is trying to move into a conversation that we have before we engage in that partnership. And so again, on the academic side, our currencies are kind of assigned and prescribed. On the community side, it's gonna vary community to community, but it could be things like, if we engage in this restoration project, what we really value is more K-12 engagement. Like we want resources or people to come in and talk to our schools or hiring local artists to make a carving or do artwork for the report or hiring local folks to cook. Um, it could be a, a wide variety of things, but the point is to have this conversation before we engage so it's transparent and we all understand what we're, what we're trying to get out of this project and through our work together. And this work is facilitated through a boundary spanner. Um, and I'll, I'll give a bit more on a boundary spanner, but it's an individual that helps connect these two, um, these two aspects. And so returning to the um, our Venn diagram from earlier, we can start to add what are some of the currencies we'd see in each of these spheres. And so in resurgent land-based, we can think about the currencies or goals of being access to culturally significant locations, assertion of sovereignty, ability to practice eco-cultural and political work as defined by the nation community, and Western and braided, um, increased knowledge. So by combining knowledge systems, we can learn more than we could through either individual knowledge system. Um, equal respect for indigenous knowledge, and well-trained mainstream scientists, meaning it takes a lot of time for a community to train a scientist to be a good, a good partner. And so as we go through this process more and we've got more well-trained scientists, it becomes easier and we don't have to go back and explain, okay, now this is how we do things. And we have a community data sharing protocol and ownership protocol, and you have to go through another IRB and you have to present to council and all, all of the things that we need to do to engage with communities. Um, on, the, on the decolonization land backside, um, one metric is just acres, regaining land base, restoration of that land base, and then not having to ask permission. And that's a big one. There's a, a, a lot of groups will say we want, um, and I think it's fine, that we want more indigenous engagement on, our, on the lands that we own and control, but you still have to ask permission. And so you have to ask permission to carry out an inherent right. We have to ask permission to land our canoes on a shoreline that is in our traditional territory. Um, and that might seem like a subtle thing, but it's a big thing. It's a big signal of you don't belong here, right? This is not your ancestral area. 
And so not having to ask permission is actually a, a, a big piece of that. And so at the middle of these complex um, relationships is a boundary spanner. An individual that spans the boundary between, in this case, we'll, we'll couch it in indigenous communities and mainstream science. This is somebody that um, we kind of came to this framework by looking at really large projects, multi-million dollar projects that have 10, 10 different First Nations, the federal government, a dozen different academics all engaged in the same project and started to kind of think about it and draw it all through. How are these interactions happening? And it's often between one or two key people that if you pull them out, everything begins to unravel. They're extraordinarily valuable and often underappreciated. These are individuals that can literally or figuratively speak multiple languages. They understand verbal and nonverbal communication in community. They can hear what's being said, even if no words are spoken. And they understand the terms, process, timelines of science. There are people that can translate and teach uh, as we go through um, these partnerships. And engaging a boundary spanner earlier in the project can lead to an equitable exchange. These are people that we want to bring on and support in the very idea stage, at, at forming our idea stage, not after the project's been written, we've already made the community mad, can we hire you to fix things, right? And so if supported early, it can lead to a braided outcome um, on, along the lines of the equitable exchange. And so but the term boundary spanner has been used uh, quite a lot, uh, frequently at the organizational structure. And so we have a uh, boundary spanning organization. Land grant institutions have cooperative extension programs that are supposed to span the boundary between what's learned at that land grant institution and the needs of farmers, uh, backyard gardeners, whatever it might be. Uh, C grant has it part of their, of their vision of uh, having thrive, thriving coastal ecosystems and communities supported by engaged, uh, by well-informed decision makers. But we chose to look at the individual level. And part of that's driven by, when I worked at Northwest Indian College, we were going through a big growth phase. When I, um, there's two sides of the campus that's separated by the road. road. The old side is a few historic buildings and a lot of government surplus trailers from the 80s and 90s, or mobile units, whatever, they're trailers. Um, and then we have all these new buildings on the new side. And the president said something that I still think about quite a lot, which is it's new buildings are nice, but it's the people inside of them that matter. And so while you can have an organization with a mission of spanning boundaries, it's people that do it. And so what are the characteristics of those people? What do they look like on an individual level? And the, sort of like idealized boundary spanner would be somebody from that community that's steeped in their culture, that has an advanced degree and understands science. They can do all of that within themselves, um, but we're not there yet in all communities. And so it can look like a trusted individual or often a small team. Uh, a number of the folks we worked with was a, a indigenous and non-indigenous partnership, two people that have been working together for years or decades. Um, could be a community member or a trusted ally, somebody that's been working there, um, lives nearby, lives in community for a long time. And they act as the fulcrum of partnership. Many things come in, in and out through them. Um, I often ask people to think about if you wanna work with a, a tribal community, who's the first person you'd call? And that's probably a boundary spanner, somebody who has a relationship that's been working with a community for a long time. Darcy Matthews and Sky Augustine are pictured here. Um, and it's on the character, they have uh, characteristics of ability to listen. Uh, their reflectors are mirrors, meaning, um, did I hear you right? Or which is what I heard? Slow down, repeat. Um, they often function as a gatekeeper, but reluctantly, meaning that they get pitched ideas all the time and they don't often feel like it's their sole responsibility to say yes or no, but lay out the process and hopefully scare away people who don't want to go through all of the work to engage in formal partnership. Uh, they understand community protocol and they have credibility both in community and in STEM. Um, on the individual level, um, their role is often an educator and again, more of an educator to the mainstream scientists of coming in, having this crazy idea, 
wanting to do it on this tribal lands or with the community and then slowing that person down and saying, okay, that's not how we do things. Here's what we need to do. A translator between science and community, a facilitator of, of meetings and projects, and an advocate for direct funding, uh, meaning both their time is valuable and they have to devote a lot of time to these projects, but also the community's involvement is valuable. Um, and one, one boundary spanner uh, said, you know, in discussion with a, with a outside collaborator, you know, the outside collaborator asked, well, what should we pay community members, you know, when we interview them? And they said, well, what do you make? Not a very comfortable conversation, but getting at the point of why is your time more valuable than theirs, right? Why, why is your knowledge more valuable than theirs? Um, we want to advocate for um, uh, equity in the project. And so from the boundary spanners, an ideal um, vision of partnership is a long-term commitment. Um, many of our boundary spanners said it's taken them a decade or more to get to where they're at. Um, they like people that are willing to experiment and do things differently, question the status quo. On the mainstream side, um, often what you wind up doing a fair amount is arguing with your administrators or grants people or the people who make the rules about you need to do this thing and it doesn't fit the rules. And so um, not taking no the first time you hear it. Um, I have gotten a few hard no's. We had a, a speaker come and it's traditional to shake somebody's hand with cash in your hand. University didn't want to give me six, $600 cash, which I fought that one for a while. It, 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 didn't, it didn't go. Um, but we did get a check on hand, which that was that even that took a lot where like this person's coming down, they're traveling, you know, a day to get here. I don't want to say in six to eight months, we'll pay you back for that. Um, but I got a lot of no's and you have to say, well, tough. Like we have a land acknowledgement. <laughs> Let's put it into practice here. Right. Um, and so also a partner willing to navigate institutional reporting mechanisms. All these projects have a, a lot of uh, reporting you have to do on the backside. And then somebody that's going to determine in the beginning what's it needed for all participants to feel valued and honored. And so having these conversations and engagement before the project gets started. I often recommend um, really starting these well before a request for proposals or an RFP comes out. Um, where we see people get in trouble is this grant's due to, in two weeks. I don't have time to do all of that. Can you sign off on this? It'll be good for your community. But building these relationships early, having these conversations, what are your skills? What are their needs? Is there a match? What would that look like? Um, and then when opportunities come up, then we can discuss that. But we've already kind of laid out where we have an overlap, some potential project ideas, and roughly what that's going to look like in, in budget space. One, one way we can kind of criticize the boundary spanner uh, framework is, are we all boundary spanners? Like in some context, perhaps, um, but context matters. And, and we're speaking, uh, that paper speaking from the experience of many folks that have been working for a long time within indigenous communities. And so the context of which we're applying this idea of a boundary spanner and what does that mean and what does it look like uh, is important to that relevant context. If we looked at the same sort of idea with long-term local fishing fleets or a multi-generational rancher, it would be different, right? Um, and so the context of that is important. Uh, we're gonna move into clam gardens. Who here has heard of a clam garden before? Okay, getting more hands, yeah, yeah. That, a while ago, we got, I get no hands. <laughs> so clam gardens are these really cool inner tile spaces that exist from here in Washington all the way through coastal BC up into Southeast Alaska. There's probably thousands of these things. Uh, we really have no idea. Uh, 15, 20 years ago, these were unknown to science, um, but have been built over thousands of years. Uh, the oldest ones we've dated are about 4,000 before present, but we're subject to sea level rise and where we can date these. So what a clam garden is, is you move rocks to low tide line to terrace a beach, just like you terrace a hill to grow more grapes. 
you can terrace the beach and increase intertidal habitat in the Goldilocks zone for butter clams, where it's not too high, they dry out and die, not too low, and they get eaten by sea stars. That's your intertidal ecology 101 lesson. Um, and so it's increasing the area, but it's also increasing the productivity. And so per square meter, we have more clams in a clam garden compared to an adjacent non-clam garden, and they're growing faster. And so if we think about it as how many can we harvest per unit area per time, it's more productive in a clam garden and there's more area. So we're increasing available harvestable biomass by, by two different ways. Additionally, this rock wall, it's a complex three-dimensional structure in a previously two-dimensional area. So as we add complexity, it increases habitat space. And so you have all sorts of other traditional foods in here, seaweeds, um, red sea cucumber, red rock crabs, snails, limpets, that are also in this area. So we've got a really complex food system here. Um, I just got lost on clam gardens. I'm sorry, I really like them. <laughs> um, and, and so um, as we're looking up and down the coast, people are reconnecting to these systems. They're um, finding clam gardens, they're reinvigorating their traditional rights and title of rebuilding and remaintaining these. And that's something that can be done without outside interference or expertise. It's within the community, we can restore these. Um, they don't need an outsider to tell them how to do that. Although what we are seeing is a lot of community to community knowledge transfer. So communities that have restored and rebuilt clam gardens are working with other communities that are interested in, interested in that. So it's a really cool process. But at the same time, there's a lot of concerns around what's in the water these days. Are these clams safe to eat? Um, are, are we concerned about red tides? What's happening with this ferry that goes back and forth 30 times a day and is pushing a big ferry wake over this clam garden? How is this relating to coastal erosion? And so in those spaces, there's a, a lot of engagement with outside researchers around specific questions. And the cool thing about clams is you can kind of view all sorts of things through the lens of a clam. Um, you know, we could talk about food security, ecosystems, the changing oceans, but there's also a lot of um, identity and ritual tied up with, with clams. There are certain stories that are only shared when you're digging clams. There are certain knowledges around clam gardens that are only shared then. There's multi-generational knowledge transfer, elders, grandparents taking their grandchildren out, teaching them how to dig clams. All of this happens around a certain area. There's a whole complex history with land ownership as well, particularly in the state of Washington. And so using the Swinomish community as an example, uh, this is taken in August uh, last year. Uh, the Swinomish community has been working for six to seven years to build a clam garden. So this is a call from the community. We're concerned about sea level rise. We're concerned about losing access to our traditional foods. We're concerned about that. Um, and we've got a small land base that's generally low lying. We've been hearing a lot about other communities re rebuilding clam gardens. Could building a clam garden from scratch be a possible solution? And then tasking their scientific staff with that question. Um, and so this process took six to seven years from idea to working community to community across the border with relatives in, in the um, Southern Vancouver Island, a couple of years of slowdown due to COVID, um, but this finally came to fruition. And this, um, I'll go back to this more quickly. This is uh, 40 tons of rock that were moved in two days. Um, so the first day was a Swinomish community only day and we laid the foundation of the rock wall, literally picking up and handing each rock down a line. Everybody touching the rock as it moved by. The second day uh, they invited uh, partners from funding agencies, outside partners that have been working on this project for the past six or seven years. And we fit in all the, all the uh, open spaces and move the rest of those 40 tons of rock. And it was a, a interesting, it was a powerful um, day to be out there. 
with everybody, you know, picking up, handing each rock down the line, forming a line. Um, elders up on the bluff, watching over what we did. Uh, huh, I lost my screen here, but it's working here. We'll keep going. Um, uh, folks up cooking, bringing salmon, um, lots of folks engaged in this project. And at the end of it, we're left, at the end of it, there's this giant wall that's built up of a complexity of different sizes of rocks, big ones, little ones, square ones, triangular ones, all meticulously and carefully fit together. Um, and at the end of the day, we're reflecting about this rock wall and this monumental thing that's happened. This isn't just a pile of rocks in a low tide. This is the first clam garden built in likely hundreds of years. And so on one timeline, this has taken six to seven years. On another timeline, this has taken a few hundred years. This is a feature that's going to be here based on the other ones we see for thousands of years that needs to be maintained, interacted with, the beach needs to be tended for many generations. And we move those rocks and put them in place. And just like all of those different rocks that fit together that made this rock wall that'll be here for hundreds of years, we're all a little bit different. We all have a little something else to share. We all have a different gift we can give. And because of that diversity and because of that cooperation, we're much stronger. We've built a strong, resilient wall, just like all of those different folks that were there. If one person wasn't there, we would have a different wall, right? That person wouldn't have put that rock right there. Somebody else would have put it somewhere else. And so it's one way of thinking about there's all, everybody has a role to play in this. Um, and through that, we can build a really resilient, strong system. Coming back to our framework here, we can think about the Swinomish example and it kind of touches on all different aspects. We can think about it as right in the center here if we wanted to. It's resurgent, it's indigenous and place-based. We as a community are concerned about sea level rise. We as a community want to use our traditional technologies to help address that and protect our resources going in the future. However, they couldn't just go out there and move the rocks. They had to engage in a long permit process with the federal and state governments around that. So it's not truly resurgent indigenous where this is our ancestral way of doing it, we're going to go do it. There's still a fair amount of interaction with the state and federal government around that. For the um, braided knowledges, uh, the community, there's a lot of community to community sharing around clam gardens. Um, there's an advisory team of us. We're not telling the community, here's how you build a clam garden. They're figuring it out. They're talking to one another. They're determining how it's built. But there's questions around, you know, what kind of sediment should be there? How fast is it going to fill in? Um, what do we do about um, toxins uh, and a fair number of other science-based questions? And also, how do we deal with funding and permitting, right? And so we're kind of coming in on that side as well. And then for the land back, I'll move to the, this picture here. For the land back, this is a really complex piece of land. This is the um, uh, Kukitelli Reserve. It's a small little um, isthmus. And it was part of the reservation and then lost through the Allotment Act, the Dawes Act. Um, so it was owned by a Swinomish family and then sold. Um, at one point in time, actually, I think UW was involved in this one. At one point in time, they're going to put a nuclear power reactor out here. And so there's some intertidal surveys from the UW in the I don't know, 70s, I want to say. Um, thankfully, it did not make this a nuclear power site, but it was eventually sold again, uh, eventually under the ownership of the same family that owned Sato St. Michelle Winery at the time. Um, and they had a house out there. And the caretaker um, and then later a boyfriend of the heiress were extremely hostile to the Swinomish community. People would come out here to try to dig clams at night. Um, and they'd be chased away with attack dogs or shotguns repeatedly. And so this is an area where the Swinomish land, Swinomish territory, got lost through Allotment Act. And when people tried to go out and just dig clams, which they're legally allowed to dig clams in intertidal, even on private lands, they're met with extreme violence. Later, um, that land went up for sale, but Swinomish couldn't buy it on their own. 
So they partnered with the state. And so now it's joint state and Swinomish controlled. Um, but as a tribal member, you still have to have a discovery pass to park there. Um, and there's a small parking lot. And so it's this complex space where we're reenacting, reinvigorating traditional technologies, but also there's a bunch of people walking their dogs and the parking lot's full um, and all of these things. And so it, it does relate to land back, but it's not fully there. It's, it's a, somewhere kind of in between. And so I like to think of, um, this is really much more than a wall. Like it's easy to look at it and say, cool, we move some rocks, right? But it's a long process that's touching on many different aspects and it's the beginning of a long process. And so um, folks involved, the community engagement around this are thinking that way, right? This is not only something that my children are gonna enjoy, but their children and their children. And so what we're doing is, is starting something that's gonna last for a long time that's complex and touches on um, many different aspects. And so with that, we'll take some time for questions here. So Aishka, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Can you go into like a little detail about like the role of the boundary scanner for the land water project? Some of the things they would have to do. Yeah. Um, coming in on the weekend to take a bunch of birds out of the freezer, to pull feathers, to make gifts for our cultural event, um, fighting with the federal government around you know how, how how do you pay somebody to cook food when they don't have a food allergy permit right that's not something that your institution wants you to do um so like on that side there's that sort of stuff um a fair amount of really working with scientists on okay there's a, a there are these two councils that oversaw what work was there and approved what projects could happen training them on how to make a short one pager in common language um, how to present their ideas without jargon. Um, and then a fair amount of interpersonal relationships on, on the community side um, and working through those interpersonal differences. Yeah. How does, uh, how does land back water rights go into um so for zoom land i'll repeat um how does waterways relate to land back um oh boy <laughs> yeah i just go to twain on that one and maybe he never said it but um in the West, uh, whiskeys for drinking and waters for fighting over. Um, so I, 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 don't, I don't know, honestly, I don't know how it relates to, to water rights. Um, it's a complex issue, so sorry. Yeah. Um, so in addition to kind of diversified strategies to promote cross cultural engagement. Yeah, so how to support cross cultural engagement in science uh, in, a, in addition to a boundary spanner. Um, one, one thing is a lot of community events are open, um, sorry, uh, are, are, are open. Um, my auntie says, if you've heard about it, you're invited. Right. And, um, which like you feel weird about, um, but if you hear about it, then you, you can go. And so I, I, often these things are shared on social media. I was sharing with the students earlier. Um, the only reason I'm on Facebook is to find clam diggers. Um, so when I worked at the tribal college, um, I would always go out and I wanted to bring somebody lummy with me to dig clams and I would ask students and they'd be busy and they, oh, my cousin, you know, blah, 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 is, might be available. If you call somebody now, like, no, nobody's going to answer their phone, right? But you put it out like, you know, clam digger needed $200 and then my inbox is full. Um, uh, that's an aside, but, the, um, but you, you can find out through events that way is a good way. And it takes time just like showing up, right? Like, People will will clock that. Like you might be kind of quiet the first day, but they'll say, "Oh, you've been coming around." Um, 
And then shared interests, right? Um, there's overlap in all of that. Um, ways of thinking about um, ecosystem management, interaction between species, um, timing, things like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so how the echo exchange work with um, other disenfranchised groups. Um, again, a lot of it's that understanding our values coming from the shared value system um, and what individuals, groups want to get out of those projects. Um, and trying to move from you know helicopter or extractive models into understanding those those needs and often you know I'll respond to um, questions that are outside of my expertise right folks will ask me some question I don't know anything about but instead of saying oh yeah whatever like it's on my obligation to figure that out and get them in in, in answer and so um, you know that's one type of currency of of answering questions or filling that need. Um, and then I oh, lost my train here, sorry. Um, and then really just, just being there, long, longer term relationships. Um, when we think about, and often in a lot of the projects that are happening, you also have to take inside into account a lot of the economic restrictions, right? Like, yes, I'm concerned about toxins in the air and water, but I'm also struggling you know, to get through my month, right? And so as we think about partnerships and, and building these relationships, economic sustainability is a big part of that as well. Yes. Previous speakers talked a lot about applying prediction models. And I'm just wondering how are scientists collaborating with indigenous people to keep models in mind with what we know kind of what we think. Um yeah, the first thing that comes to mind is uh the relocation funding that's come down um 100 million uh recently 75 million going to alaska 25 million going to quinault um where it's not really a prediction it's our village is washing away um and i think one thing i think is also interesting is the phenology the timing of species interactions or signals when this plant is right, then the animals are in this location or the fish are here. That's starting to break down a bit as well, um, as well as things like harmful algal blooms are occurring in a wider window. Um, and so I think understanding what's what's separating those, what's causing that breakdown in the, the seasonal timing that's existed for a long time is, is also interesting. Should I take a couple of questions from Zoomland? Um, oh, repeat it. Okay, I did that. Um, okay, here's a question uh, from Patrick Christie. Within the notion of land back, could you ever imagine or would you welcome an indigenous only fishing areas within the Salish Sea as a response to call from marine protected uh, areas? Um, there are examples of that in the Central Coast. Um, there's a number of area, there's two examples that come to mind. Um, I know the question about say the sheep, but two examples come to mind. One is uh, some closed crabbing areas. Um, I know a couple of Central Coast nations have been doing this, Heltzik has. And then an example of um, indigenous resurgence that I didn't mention is the Heltzik herring example where um, Heltzik uh, stopped commercial herring harvest in their territory. And so they have fought and won for retention of the right to engage in what's called SOK, spawn on kelp, line with blades of kelp, herring spawn on it, and it's sold and traded. Um, the, the commercial industry comes in with per se net, catches all the herring, most of the values in the row, the rest goes to the fish mill. Um, they've successfully pushed back and stopped commercial fishing in their area for herring. Um, what that would look like in the Salish Sea, um, there is a small closed area around the Lummi Reservation for salmon fishing, um, but my guess it would be probably species specific, um, and I don't know exactly where or what that would look like, but those are the two models I would look at for as examples. I'll go in the back first with the mask. <laughs> 
Um, you talked a bit about the importance of understanding the rights of the community. I think that makes sense. Um, I found that sometimes there's more issues that arise when value systems of the scientists and other non state members is kind of not clear, considering for them. Do you have, is that something you've experienced? Is there any advice? Um, so the question was, communities have a clear value system, uh, more understood value system, but for external scientists, it's sometimes not always clear. Is that a, a fair summation? Okay. Um, and examples of that. Um, you know, when we think about what are our values in a project, they're often reflected in how we allocate our resources. Um, and so there can be a, a, a disparate um those can be different as well as we often wind up with this system where the institution or our personal values want us to do a thing but then the structures in place make that difficult i've used a couple examples handshakes um funding members um doing things that are outside of the box you know how do you are taking the time to go harvest cedar and make woven gifts things like that, that aren't, our institutions aren't necessarily set up for that. And so I think that's where you, sometimes you see a difference between, we're not really sure what our values, differences in our values, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, with the glasses. So uh, when you talk about boundary standards, I've also heard the term uh, liaison. Is there something, is, are these two connected to each other or is the being a uh, boundary standard something that's more whole, that concept? Yeah, I um, I think of as a boundary center is more than a liaison um, in that there's both a lot of cultural competency that has to happen and then knowledge on the science side. Um, and they're, they're not replaceable, right? That they're an integral part that if you pluck it out and then try to put another person in there and say, okay, you're the liaison now, you're the boundary spanner now, it doesn't work. It's built on long-term relationships and understanding and trust um, that is sort of definitional to who they are, um, but also goes beyond just cross-cultural communication. And Julie wants to add. Well, <laughs> can you imagine cultivating boundary standards within an academic framework? And particularly, I'm thinking about drastic. Yeah, yeah, so, so the question was, um, can boundary spanning be learned in the academic setting? Um, when we had these conversations with, um, so we, Julie's a co-author on the paper, uh, when we had these conversations with half a dozen or so boundary spanners, I think it was over dinner, we asked this question, like, what did you learn in college that's related to this? And the answer was nothing. And <laughs> with, the, with, you know, with the caveat for you know, higher ed, that many of these people graduated, not recently. Um, but it's something we've been thinking about um, and particularly around what would that, I guess, think about like, what would that look like? And um, I think at the graduate level, it would make sense. Um, and maybe even if like a certificate program was one idea that's been, been tossed around where there are individuals that, uh, maybe are kind of already doing that work um, and an extra credential would, would help them from a career standpoint um, or how, how you would do that. It takes a fair amount of time. When uh, one piece of advice I often give um, for graduate students is and PIs is that these relationships need to be maintained for a long time. And so I, I generally don't suggest a grad student go out and form these relationships uh, because no offense, but grad students are ephemeral. The goal is for you to leave and go on and do something wonderful, um, but that relationship needs to be maintained. And unless they're from that community, then it's a bit different. Um, and so I think that there's things we can do around trainings and workshops and working with communities that we have existing relationships with, but I don't think there's a, okay, here's the recipe book. Why don't you go find a community level of engagement? Yeah. All right, I think we'll cut it off there. And uh, there's a reception outside if you didn't get your uh, cup of that.